from the Victory Studios in downtown Little Rock, this is Capital View with your host, Jesse Tenor. Good Sunday morning to you and welcome into Capital View. I'm Jesse Tenor. The 2018 midterm election is in the books. This morning we'll assess what comes next and the strategy for the most competitive race in Arkansas, which still isn't over. In many ways, it may feel like nothing changed here in Arkansas. Republicans held all seven constitutional offices in the state's four congressional seats. The competitive race for a state Supreme Court seat went to the incumbent and the balance of power remains exactly what it was before Tuesday. But there were some consequential outcomes from election night in 2018. We'll talk about some of the biggest results this half hour with our panel, Republican Party spokesman Steve Hauserman and Democratic Party spokesman Reed Brewer. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you for, uh, having, thanks for having us. So I know you're newbies to Capitol View, but you helped us out a lot on Election Day. And so um, you gave good insight then, figured you'd give great post-election insight now. So first wanted to get with AR2. So um, moving forward, Reed, um, Tucker was kind of talking about what he had planned. Um, first, I want to play a little bit about what he's saying, because I think it could be a little surprising for people. I always want to serve my community, and seeking elected office is one way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. So there's no way I will not be engaged in some way. And I, I just care too much about this community and this state. And I'll always, I don't know exactly what that looks like right now at this moment, but I'll always be engaged somehow. I did take a leave from the practice of law this year to run for Congress. And so it's not just figuring out what I'm going to do with my political life. Right now, I'm, I kind of have a, a chance to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, period. And uh, I'm, so it's kind of a fresh start and I'm, I'm excited about that. So Reed, he is talking about a fresh start here, but it sounds like it will be still in Arkansas. But I mean, does the Democratic Party already have plans for Tucker? What can you see moving forward? I think the all options are open for Clark. I mm -hmm. think he did an exceptionally great job about closing that gap. I mean, we saw it widen to like 12 points in the Hendricks College poll and he got it down to six. He did a lot of things that I think a lot of people had handicapped him not being able to do well, which was really run up the score in Pulaski County. He definitely did that. Uh, but he also did it in a way where he didn't have to rely on kind of attack ads at all. You never saw him once go after French Hill any kind of personal way. You never saw him go after him on anything except policy and, uh, and except engaging on talking points uh, that were cordial. And I think that, you know, you see that across people. I think he got a lot of respect for that. I think that, you know, I saw him on his, uh, uh, at his concession speech and it was one of the best speeches I've ever heard him give. I think he's got a bright future. I think he'll go do a lot of great things. I mean, you know, that's 16,000 votes and he's the next congressman. I think there's a lot to be said about that. There's a lot of... Uh, great qualities that he has and he ran a really great campaign with good messaging and like I said kept it all above the belt that's some great stuff. What would your response be to that and how French Hill ran his campaign? Well it, it was interesting in Pulaski County because we uh, you know just an overall you know scope of what happened we kept a lot of our legislative seats we obviously won French's race and uh, with with everything going on with the mayor's race uh, primary liberal Democrats running in those um, um, even though it's nonpartisan we knew that it was going to be a big Democrat turnout um, it necessarily didn't turn out that way especially accounting for Faulkner County Celine uh, French pulled ahead and we kind of expected that especially looking at polls before the race the election moving forward what should Hill do as a congressman now elected to his third term mm -hmm. to appeal to Tucker supporters and let them know well you know I am your congressman this is what I'm going to mm -hmm. do to work for you well I think what's going to happen is um, as we move forward into the current administration and and the the, the new House of representatives um, we're going to see you know a continued success in the economy we're going to see some uh, changes to health care uh, hopefully for the better that steers away from a lot of the damage that Obamacare did in the past and I think that's going to translate into results and people will start to notice the progressive um, uh, advantage of a more conservative health care program and uh, with the tax cuts also, uh, people are going to feel good about that. I think, you know, you saw French Hill run ads that mm -hmm. saying that he would protect pre-existing conditions when in fact his actual vote had been against the protection of pre-existing conditions. So I think the first thing he could do is at least stand by the word that he at least promoted in this campaign, something that I would argue he might not have done so far. And I would also argue that there are common, there is common ground if, uh, among both of them, uh, both Clark and Tucker, at least in terms of uh, fair wages and at least in terms of a uh, you know small business tax cuts we'll see if French Hill returns to those roots or if he goes back to you know giving a uh, tax break to the richest uh, uh, in the community or if he actually does what he says and let's not put a sunset on those taxes that he passed earlier this year. Now you could say I'm jumping the gun on this a little bit but we already saw Senator Tom Cotton announce oh that no. he was seeking re-election <laughs> in 2020. Um, any ideas going forward what how that's gonna play out? Read any I mean 
anybody that you can see challenging him at this point in time? I think there's going to be a lot of people actually get into that race or at least start giving voice to being in that race. Uh, but make no mistake, Tom Cotton's going to be a tough opponent. I think that, uh, and then with, especially with uh, President Trump's re-election also on the ballot, that's going to be a tough race. But I think that it's not out of reach as the way I think you would have seen that uh, a few years ago. I think that Tom Cotton has done a lot of things that have uh, perceived him in a negative light. I think that he, uh, every time he gets into that national spotlight, it's not always in Arkansas's best interest. And I think that that stuff's going to come up. Uh, I think that if you look at someone like uh, Ted Cruz in Texas, who's done a very a lot of uh, similar things about attracting some kind of negative attention, I think that uh, Cotton fills that role a little bit. Uh, we'll see if we can gin up a challenge like Beto gave uh, Cruz in, in uh, Texas. We'll see if we can replicate some of that success in Arkansas. But I, I think there's going to be a lot of people uh, itching to get get after uh, uh, Senator Cotton in 2020. I think the Democrats could throw the kitchen sink at Senator Cotton and he's going to come out on top. He is a phenomenal representative of Arkansas. Um, I think that he does a good job of capturing um, a lot of the issues that Americans have in, at the national level, especially foreign policy. He is able to address that anxiety in a, in a well in a pretty well established way. Um, and when it does come to that 2020 election, um, he's going to definitely come out on top. So. I, and I, I have to give uh, Senator uh, Cotton a, a compliment. I went to his town mm -hmm. hall, you know, uh, was it wasn't 2017, and there's not a lot of representatives that would stand in front of a, you know, relatively liberal crowd in Springdale mm -hmm. and, and get uh, come bombarded with uh, questions and uh, questions about his uh, uh, loyalty or the state. But he did do that, and I think that. Uh, it shows a lot of tenacity on his part, and uh, any Democrat that goes after him has to realize that he has that tenacity, has that ability to engage with the citizens, and uh, they're going to have to match it at minimum mm -hmm. to have any kind of any kind of hope in 2020. Exactly. No matter the party, you can definitely respect that. Right. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> yeah. That was those. Those were tough questions that he mm -hmm. got there. Most definitely. Well, we're going to take a quick break, guys, but we'll okay. be right back. Coming up after a quick break, we'll break down some of the big results and surprises in the state legislative races. You're watching Capitol View on Sunday morning. Ranked among the nation's best value cities for travel and most travel-worthy state capitals, Little Rock is known for its southern charm and hospitality. With a variety of amazing attractions and museums, wonderful restaurants and shops, and a thriving artisanal food and craft beverage scene, Little Rock is a great city to visit and explore. Request a vacation planning kit at littlerock.com and see why we say getaways are better with a southern accent. Hey, no, I'm, I'm driving Dad to the hospital. He was just playing with Emma and he hit his head, but then he wouldn't stop bleeding and he got dizzy. Right, the blood thinner for um, AFib. How you doing, Dad? I'll be okay. Listen, we're pulling in. I'm going to call you back. This is the third time he's been admitted with a serious bleed. Is this blood thinner really helping him? I understand your concern. Your father's atrial fibrillation increases his risk for stroke. This is why you're on warfarin. But there is an alternative. Another pill? No, it's called Watchman. Watchman is a permanent implant that reduces the risk of strokes. In a clinical trial, 9 out of 10 people who received Watchman stopped taking warfarin in 45 days. There are risks associated with the Watchman implant, including internal bleeding, stroke, and in rare cases, it can be fatal. Talk to your cardiologist so that you thoroughly understand all the benefits and risks to see if Watchman is right for you. Learn more at Watchman.com. Uh, sold it, sold it, sold it. Husky County Absolute Real Estate and Personal Property Auction. Thursday, November 15th, starting at 10 a.m. at 9812 Interstate 30 in Little Rock, Arkansas. A move-in ready mixed-use facility with a 3,000 square foot office, 13,000 square feet of warehouse space, excellent Interstate 30 visibility with a daily traffic count of 80,000. Also selling a Mercedes, SL560, a Triumph, TR6, convertible, Polaris, slingshot, barbecue grills, appliances, and a hot tub. Everything is seller growth of price on auction day. Go to WilsonAuctioneers.com. Uh, sold it, sold it, sold it. Capital View, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. Welcome back to Capitol View. Across the U.S., women made history Tuesday night. A record number of female lawmakers will serve in Congress starting in 2019. And Arkansas also set a record for most women lawmakers. Some who won say the legislature is finally starting to reflect the makeup of the state. Yeah. 
In 1919, Arkansas approved the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote in all elections. Several years later, Frances Hunt and Earl Chambers became the first two women to serve together in the Arkansas House of Representatives. By 1982, only 25 women had held seats in the House. Today, the same number will now serve together. Everyone is probably tired of hearing me talk about a blue wave, but there is also a bikini wave. <laughs> State Representative Vivian Flowers just got elected to her third term. Others in the House ran uncontested, while some newcomers, like Denise Garner, beat out male incumbents in major upsets. I felt like our legislators were not listening to their voters, to their constituents. These women made state history. With their seven female colleagues in the Senate, a total of 32 will serve in the legislature. The previous record was 31 in 2009. One man's mob is another woman's movement. Election results haven't been certified, but but if the numbers hold, these women will start their terms in 2019, the same year as the 100-year celebration of women's suffrage in Arkansas. And let's bring in Reed Brewer and Steve Hauserman back into this, the discussion. So, guys, definitely women in uh, both parties, a lot of good candidates there from Republicans and Democrats. So moving forward, how do you think having more women in the legislature, albeit one, mm -hmm. compared to right. 2009, uh, will maybe change the discussion and some of the things that we see come out of the legislature? I, I'll tell you, the, Re the Republican Party is super proud of the amount of women we've been able to uh, run on our ballot. It's a real testament um, that so many conservative women have stepped up and answered the call to serve um, and you know I think that continues especially at the local level we had plenty of ladies that that ran um, and in the legislature we have a sizable um, women uh, caucus uh, for Republicans so what about it from the Democratic Party standpoint even though it's the minority party the first time that there has been a supermajority going into it right. I, that doesn't sound like that's going to d defeat a lot of the Democratic women either no I don't think so I think you see uh, a lot of the new faces in that legislature that have changed just the makeup of it while the numbers are the same I think the priorities are going to be uh, different I uh, you, you think about somebody like Denise Gardner beating off uh, uh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie Collins uh, uh, you think of Nicole Clowney, you think of uh, Megan Godfrey winning, you know, uh, by a narrow margin, but in a pretty triumphant victory. You know, they're going to go into a legislature, and even Tippi McAuliffe here in Little Rock, mm -hmm. you're going to see uh, their things change. I think it's a lot harder for Republican representatives to put forth a, a bill that would hurt women when now that the, they're going to have to stand not only with the colleagues on their own side, but across the side and they're going to see a lot of female faces. I think priorities change when you have to look at somebody that is, does not represent your identity, that looks different than you. And uh, when the legislative packages and when that legislative work happens, I think you're going to see a lot of different changes, a lot of different priorities shift, even if those numbers still have stayed the same, 76-24. Mm -hmm. And then, Steve, let's get into the District 84 race since Reed brought that up. So, Charlie Collins being ousted by Denise mm -hmm. Garner. I mean, what was that like to watch as a Republican? Because it seemed like the party kind of thought that he had this one in the bag. Yeah, you know, Charlie was a great representative. Um, he, ran a, he ran his campaign well. Uh, they both did. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, Charlie uh, ran on a record, and he had a good record. Uh, he, what he campaigned for in the past is what he voted for when he was in the legislature, um, and he stuck to his guns, literally. Uh, so <laughs> we, I like that. We, um, we, we love Charlie Collins, and, and it's unfortunate that he didn't win re-election, uh, but you know, that's how it goes. We think that Denise ran a good race, and ultimately she came on top. Now, I will say he is one of those, like Cotton that we were talking about earlier, who can stand in front of a room with people who hate him and still have a good discussion. Right, yeah. So you can at least respect him for that. Absolutely. I, yeah, I will say that with Charlie Collins is uh, he, um, he was honest about what he campaigned on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, I think there's a lot of respect to be had for that. So what crushed him? Was it really the enhanced carry part that voters said, I absolutely do not agree with this and his constituency? Or what made Denise the ultimate victor? I think, there's, I think that there is that. I think that his record was hard to defend, right? You know, you passed a bill that required an additional passage of another bill to make that bill even work properly. I think that there's a critiques that you could offer on that. But I also think that what is different in this race is that Denise ran on a message. You know, she's a, she's a registered nurse. She ran on health care. She ran on the idea that, that when you send somebody to Washington from this, can, this part of the state, that you need to have a voice. And, they, and while that voice is represented in Charlie Collins, and there's definitely a voice there, that might not, that voice wasn't used for the priorities they wanted it to. And I think you know, it comes down to that. She did a lot of field work. She did an impressive mail program. She went to every meeting she could possibly could and filled the room. I think she just ran a campaign that showed that you can have a voice that represents your priorities, not just a loud voice, which is what uh, Charlie Collins often was. What yeah. up? 
Go ahead. I was going to say, I'll also add that I don't think Charlie lost on a single issue. Right, um, I don't that, think so. Yeah, that bill had, you know, multiple co-sponsors, and there are other similar bills right. that had sponsors, and mm -hmm. they all, you know, fared very well in Arkansas as Republicans, so. It just became an indefensible bill, I think, after a while, because of the, there's so many problems that there were, and, you know, everything from bringing a gun into a Razorback game, into the bar, into the state capitol, there, it wasn't thought through all the way through, but I agree, I agree with Stephen that that isn't a bill that cost him an election, it just one made that this election way more important. What about God? Free. Her win over Williams was a lot tighter, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people were saying that they responded well to the fact that she's bilingual, that she was going out into the community and going right. to places where a Republican hadn't been before. So, Reed, first off, what did what did she do right here? Well, I think she went directly into that community. You know, she is bilingual, and she has, but she's also just a mother that sends her kids to schools every day, and so she has a lot in common with that. Uh, with that community, you know, she also did a lot of amazing like campaign things, like you know, everything from being on an ice cream truck and being in neighborhoods <laughs> to going to Latino uh, and Latinx uh, uh, owned businesses and talking to them about their concerns. Because it isn't just one voting block there, you know, it's it's about building a coalition, and she definitely did that. And it is a narrow margin, but it's one that shows that just how important one vote counts. And she knocked on God knows how many doors, called who knows how many people, sent out mail to who knows how many people to make sure that her message of uh, let's build a new voice, let's build a new community could be heard. And I think uh, this was one of the races that we had targeted, and I think we did everything we could, and that shows that under Chairman Gray's leadership that committing hard to these state rep races is really the right way to go and talking about a way to expand our electorate, not just rely on a base vote. What did Williams need to do? I mean, I didn't hear the Republicans talking about this race a whole mm -hmm. lot is one that they were completely concerned about, but I mean, we now know where it stands. We knew, you know, we knew that uh, that that would be a tougher race because the candidate on the opposing side obviously was working hard as he was. Uh, he was out door knocking. I know he had plenty of volunteers there. We were doing mailers. Um, so ultimately, it just came out to turn out. Um, and I think that what helped uh, his opponent is that there's a large, you know, uh, college student base there that was also helping with his camp or her campaign. So, um, you know, it's just, that's something we could look at. We know that that seat's recapturable um, and you can expect us to do that next time around. So, <laughs> All okay, right, there you go. <laughs> <on that one. laughs> um, a big win for the Republicans though was on being able to unseat the Democratic Party chair mm -hmm. in his state rep seat. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to play um, some sound that I got from Chairman Gray about his defeat. Mm -hmm. What would your response be just to the thought that maybe some will voice, maybe some will never, that if you can't win a state rep seat, then why should you be chair? Oh, well, I think that's an interesting question, and I, I, I welcome that. Um, I would say I sacrificed a lot to become chair. I won two counties where Trump won. And I have a unique perspective that if we're going to change the conversation, if we're going to see these leaders in the legislature promote good ideas and be for something, then there needs to be a party there that can help them be that voice. So Steve, I mean, how do you perceive this big win though, being able to unseat the chair? I mean, should he stay the leader of the Democratic Party? Uh, that's gonna be up to the Democrats. Um, if they wanna elect somebody else and, and try their hand again, that's fine. Uh, what we saw with, the, with the, uh, that particular race is that, um, you know, Chairman Gray had supported a new platform with the Democrat Party that supported um, higher taxes, uh, the death tax, they supported uh, Roe v. Wade for the first time. I, I don't know if that's the first time in your platform history, but they did support um, abortion, things like that, and, and in a district that largely went to Trump, I mean, it was, it was kind of obvious that that was a flippable seat. Within the Democratic Party, he has a massive amount of support. I think that you can look at the, you know, we're, we're, if you count that race in the Scott Baltz race, you're talking about 200 votes from an entirely different legislative session. So the idea that this is all about a referendum on abortion or the, on higher taxes, neither of which Michael John advocated for directly or anything like that is, is kind of crazy. But as, the, the, as the chairman of the Democrat Party, that would be his... Well, those, those are... Those are uh, those are individuals, and those are a uh, whole party wide that makes that decision, not Michael Don. So it's, you know, and we saw this a lot from the Republican Party about running on Nancy Pelosi, running on these other th higher taxes, none of which were actually what actually was happening or anything that our candidates were advocating for. To be fair, so that's that's a little bit unfair. But I would say that. Michael John won, you know, uh, Jackson County. Jackson County voted for uh, uh, Donald Trump well, by nearly a thousand votes, and he won that county. And the reason he won that county is because he has done the work in that county. You know, this wasn't, you know, Craig Christensen wasn't an exceptionally strong opponent. He was just a Republican, and 
and, and in a district that is favoring Republicans strongly. And he was able to win in certain counties. He was able to win Woodruff County, which Trump also won, because he was able to put a coalition together. Was it enough? It felt 98 votes short. But had it not been his ability to put that coalition together, it wouldn't have even been a larger margin. But yes, they did win. Uh, I have every uh, confidence in Michael John being able to lead this party. And I think that if it wasn't his for, for his leadership, I don't know if we would have won the races that we did win. Mm -hmm. And I think that this just really restores confidence in voters that really every vote counts because a lot of these were super close. So mm -hmm. tight. You're mm -hmm. talking about a totally different legislative session. If 200 vote, you know, if we had flipped 100 votes, that that shows you you got to vote. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to take a quick break, okay. but when we come back, we'll look at the race that hasn't ended yet. The campaign for Little Rock mayor heads to a runoff. We'll look at what the next few weeks will bring in this race. You're watching Capital View on Sunday morning. Come and enjoy a new experience in shopping for your home. At Aladdin Rugs and Home Decor, we have over 5,000 rugs in the latest colors and styles. Bring your pillows, your pillow shams, and sizes. We will help you select the perfect rug. We're number one in customer service with 15,000 square feet of rugs, unique home decor, wallpaper, and flooring. Remember, buy today, take it home today, and save. Why wait? Don't suffer through knee pain, shoulder pain, back pain, or pain from your cancer treatments. Dr. Qureshi and his staff at Arkansas Spine and Pain are here to give you the relief you've been looking for. Call today. You deserve to get your life back. ASAP. Ah, sold it, sold it, sold it. Attention commercial developers and investors. Lender ordered. Absolute auction. Wednesday, November 28th. Two choice. Lowe's out parcels in Bryan, Arkansas. Seller regardless of price. Go to wilsonauctioneers.com. Solid, solid, solid. It's Black Friday going on all month long at Phil Rod Autoplex. So what does that mean to you? That's great savings. Like a 2019 Chevrolet Equinox, zero down, zero percent financing at only $339 a month. Or Black Friday savings on a 2018 Chevrolet Malibu up to $7,500 off or zero percent for 60 months. 2018 Chevrolet Silverado up to $14,000 off or zero percent financing for 72 months. So find new roads at Phil Rod Autoplex, exit 84, just off 540 Russellville. It seems they go from just learning to walk to driving in the blink of an eye. It's amazing how quickly things change. And it doesn't really stop. Now they take care of me more than I do of them. I know they worry. That's why it's good to know there's help. If you have questions about rehabilitation, home health, or care after a hospital stay, call Kindred. See how we can help. 1-866-KINDRED. In 2004, in a tiny Ozark town, a young woman named Rebecca Gold was brutally murdered. An Arkansas cold case playing out before a national audience. I feel like a podcast is the perfect way to tell the story. It's a small town, and I know someone has a secret that will break this case wide open. I want to know the truth. The family hopes this new attention could finally expose the killer. I think so many people are going to be utterly shocked. Murder in the Ozarks, Tuesday at 10. You're watching Capital View, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. Welcome back to Capitol View. The most competitive race at any level in Arkansas did not end on election night. Five men ran to become Little Rock's next mayor. No one cleared the required 40% threshold, so the capital city will see a runoff in a few weeks between the top two vote getters, Frank Scott Jr. and Baker Curris. Earlier this week, both men laid out their runoff strategies. We need to reaffirm the votes of the 25,076 people that voted for Frank Scott Jr. We're very appreciative of them, and we have to make sure that they come out again. Uh, we also want to make certain that we reach out not only to uh, State Representative Work Saban's voters, we also want to go after uh, uh, Superintendent Baker Curtis's voters. So we're going after any and everyone right now. The game plan is really just to amplify what we've been saying and be certain that everybody knows what we can do. And that's that's bold new direction. It'll it'll everything will change if I get in City Hall dramatically, and I want. I I want people to understand that very clearly. And joining me back to talk about this is Steve Hauserman and Reed Brewer. So first, I thought it'd be interesting to hear from the man who didn't clear that threshold, and that is State Representative Warwick Saban. Here's what he had to say. I haven't decided if I'm even going to get involved in the campaign. I'm, I'm still sort of mulling that because, again, they're both good guys. And, you know, I'm not sure whether, you know, anybody wants to hear from the third place guy about, you know, who I'm supporting, but um, I'm going to think about it over the weekend. 
I have no plans to leave Arkansas. I don't know why anybody would even worry about that. But, um, you know, I've, I've been in the state since I was 17 years old when I came here for college. Um, I've had tremendous opportunities. I love being here. And, um, you know, I'm back at work already. So he may not end up endorsing either candidate. What does Frank Scott Jr. and Baker Curris have to do to make sure that they get more of the votes from Saban's base? They need to be knocking a lot of doors. Um, that should be their priority. They're obviously going to be sending mailers. Commercials are going to continue to go on. Um, the election never stopped for them. So they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Um, and both of them are going to try to capture that niche that voted for them the first time. And they're going to have to expand on that by possibly opening some new doors that they didn't have during the regular election. What would some of those new doors be, perhaps? <laughs> well, I think whoever wins this race is going to have to do it with a coalition that we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. I think that Frank Scott uh, came out and he did exactly what he needed to do, which was to put together his base in Southwest Little Rock. That's where he's from. You know, he always talks about being a being a son of Southwest Little Rock, and he combined to that uh, with a lot of the uh, uh, progressive neighborhoods. And then he ate into a lot of the uh, more uh, Republican-leaning areas in West Little Rock. And if he can do that again, I think that we're looking at Mayor Frank Scott. But I think that if Baker can bring that West Little Rock stronghold, combine it with that Heights area, and then do the work in those uh, built African-American communities in those uh, depressed uh, uh, economically uh, challenged areas, you know, by the airport and further down, uh, you know, south of 630, I think that we're talking about uh, Baker Curris as mayor. So I, mm -hmm. I think wh whoever wins this is going to have a coalition we haven't seen before, and I think whichever one of us, our, our parties wants to do better in <laughs> Pulaski County has to realize that and has to be able to replicate that. And I think all of us are going to be watching because this is going to be a tight race and uh, like you said, it comes down to who can reach out uh, the most effectively. Reed, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show and breaking pleasure. it all thank down with now. us. And stay with us. We're back to wrap it all up after this. You're watching Capitol View on Sunday morning. The quarter pound double stack cheeseburger from Sonic with two layers of melty cheese right in the middle. You know what they say. It's what's on the inside that counts. Get a $2.99 double stack cheeseburger plus tots before they're gone. This is how you Sonic. Season's biggest mystery. Every person on that plane lost five years. Is about to be cracked wide open. Maybe she's responsible for what happened on the plane. Finally, I've been waiting for you. Manifest, Monday on NBC. There's so much melty cheese in this double stack cheeseburger. Two layers of melty cheese. Take it easy. I'm having a meltdown. I know. Hey, let's just snap out of it, okay? Just try to... Well, Sorry, what is this supposed to do? Get the new quarter pound double stack cheeseburger plus tots and try order ahead to get happy hour anytime. You're watching Capital View, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. And that's it for today's show. Don't forget, you can now take Capital View on the go. Download Capital View podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. We're back with an all-new Capital View next week. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.